okay shilpa madam you can start good morning everyone so i welcome you to this uh, session i hope all of you have given feedbacks on the google link that we that dr jay posted today if you have not then i uh, request one of you to give the feedback it helps us navigate our problems and also help us uh, do better in the better so, class i'll see you inside the workshop yeah shilpa madam please continue so i request all of you to give your feedbacks on the google link posted by dr j yesterday uh, this will help us to choose better topics and also to cater to your needs and also to help us in uh, like you know improving our content so this session of uh, how to manage uh, the fluid in the endometrial cavity has been requested by many so we had to do this topic so to do today was some other topic which was supposed to be done uh, but since a lot of people have requested this we are going ahead with this over to you sir uh, to take it forward yeah so hi everyone and good morning see i am going to be talking about fluid in endometrial cavity and all the things which people will never find anywhere because i know when you try to study fluid in endometrial cavity the commonest thing which appears on google youtube facebook wherever you search is people are going to tell you if the fluid okay anterior posterior diameter in the sagittal plane is more than 3 mm okay it is a poor outcome if it is less than 3 mm then it is an unknown outcome but i don't believe that is the method to uh, clinically okay decide what is thin and what is what is the fluid in endometrial cavity so i'm going to be starting my screen sharing okay shilpa madam just see if my uh, this thing uh, if my screen is uh, yeah it's visible if my screen is uh, visible to you yes yeah so i think see friends what is important to understand is how to clinically manage fluid in endometrium okay that is very 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 important okay so when i draw this i i do know somebody has complained about my handwriting so i will try to make it as nice as i can okay endometrial cavity fluid okay now try and understand this entire concept of fluid in endometrial cavity if you understand that no then your life is settled you don't really have to think of anything else okay see i will draw the reproductive system first that's the vagina then there is the cervix then there is the uterus sagittal plane okay and you have fallopian tubes here correct two fallopian tubes so i will draw just one for the time being and you have the ovary okay and here you have the endometrium now fluid in endometrium is going to be understood when you understand the physiology of the development of endometrium okay so what typically happens is when you are looking at early menses inside early menses that means on day 1 2 3 4 you are going to have blood which is present inside the endometrial cavity and this blood which is present in the endometrial cavity in the early menstrual cycle so day 1 to day 4 when you have fluid in the endometrial cavity 99% of it is going to be blood just remember this thing okay the only difference is if you have a loculated fluid here okay so if you have only loculated fluid which is present in the endometrial cavity in the early thing okay only if it is a loculated fluid then you have to think of adhesions okay just keep this small thing in mind okay that is the first thing you have to understand after that we have all studied the menstrual cycle so by the day 4 the follicle in this ovary is going to be recruited so one follicle you know is going to start becoming the dominant follicle and as when as the cycle advances by approximately day day 9 there is going to be this follicle which is going to become a nice 12 mm follicle okay after day 8 day 9 let's say on day 13 to 15 this thing is going to become a huge dominant follicle so your predominant growth in the endometrium occurs from day 6 onwards till day 12 onwards okay this is your predominantly the growth phase of the endometrium okay this is predominantly under the able guidance of the hormone estrogen this is where the thickness increases okay but we have all studied the menstrual cycle so we already know that there is an e2 peak which occurs and this e2 peak is mandatory in the menstrual cycle for the lh surge to occur 
and prior to the LH surge occurring, we all know that there is a small progesterone rise which occurs. Okay, this is something which we have studied, we have explained in so many master classes. So what typically happens is once the endometrium, okay, this small triple line which we are typically seeing, this triple line will start appear somewhere from approximately day eight, day nine, and it will stay till approximately day thirteen to fourteen where ovulation is going to occur. Okay, so whenever we are studying that, what is going to happen is in this phase is where you have this peak of estradiol which is occurring. Okay, so sometimes what can happen is this hyper E2, excessive E2 which is generated or, or there is a hyper response to E2. Okay, both the things are important. Either there is supraphysiological estradiol or there is a supraphysiological response to estradiol. In both these situations, if I magnify this endometrium here for you and see this is the basal endometrium on both the sides. From the basal endometrium, you are going to have development of stratum compactum. Okay, that is the important part of the endometrium. Both the sides, you will have stratum compactum. Okay, and this stratum compactum under the effect of estrogen will develop something called as functional endometrium. Okay, this blue colored thing is the functional endometrium. So the ecogenic stripe which you see, this stripe which you see is the meeting of the functional endometrium. Okay, under the effect of estrogen, what happens is this functional endometrium starts providing nourishing fluids. Okay, nutrients. Okay, this nourishing fluid is any which way is present inside the endometrium. Okay, but sometimes, sometimes there is a hyperfluid which comes in. Okay, so you have this fluid accumulation which typically occurs at the widest part of the endometrial cavity. Okay, sometimes you will see this. Okay, and that is predominantly either due to stimulation that is hyperestrogen or we will come to this hyper response to estrogen, which predominantly in, includes infections, adhesions, and microflora, microbiotics. Okay. So we'll just like look into each of this very specifically now. Okay. So what should we understand? Now see, if in case we see the fluid here, okay, if in case there is excessive fluid here, so how will your endometrium start appearing to you? See, your endometrium will start appearing like this. There is a triple line here. And then there is a fluid layer here. Correct. Now, this is the fluid layer which you are going to see inside and you are going to be worried. Are, 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 you know what is this? So, whenever you see this central fluid, just remember, whenever you see this central fluid, it is almost always going to be a hyper amount of nourishing fluid, which in cases of IVF, ovarian stimulation of any form, okay, is going to be mostly functional. Okay. It is just going to be functional response. And this, if this diameter, okay, is less than 3 millimeter, then you really need not worry because what is going to happen is the secretory changes. This progesterone peak here is going to start inducing secretory changes and secretory changes has large vacuoles which are present and these vacuoles will just absorb this fluid off. Okay, just keep this small pointer in your head. But for that, it is important that it is centrally placed. Okay, it is predominantly between this window, day 8, day 9 to day 13, 14, and it is less than 3 millimeters. All these things are very, very important. Okay, when you have a fluid like this, in my private experience, if the patient is scheduled for a fresh transfer, it is better to cancel it because it is extremely difficult to make a patient understand that nothing will happen in the presence of less than 3 millimeter fluid. Okay, it is the best to cancel it. It is the best to cancel your cycle. Okay, it is better that when you switch to your next cycle for your embryo transfer in all these types of patients, whenever there is present of a central fluid in your next cycle, when you want to do an FET, in these patients, it is always better to give modified natural cycle because modified natural cycle is dependent on natural estrogen where there is no hyper response to estrogen. And if you want to give one step further, you should give letrozole. Okay, because letrozole will reduce the E2 levels very nicely. So there comes the role of letrozole in managing of endometrial cavity fluid. The day in your ovarian stimulation, along with HMG, HP, you start adding letrozole 
you will see that your peak E2 level does not really occur as a result of which the physiological fluid doesn't really come into play as a result of which the amount of endometrial cavity fluid, which is physiological, okay, I'm talking of physiological fluid will go down drastically by addition of letrozole in your stimulation cycle. So that is your clinical point, okay, and that will really, 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 really help you do fresh transfers despite having hyper responder patients or normal responder patients okay so that is something which is very very important for you to understand okay now this is the physiological aspect okay but now let's not talk of uh, let's not talk of physiological aspect let's go on to some pathological aspects of endometrial cavity fluid so one of the most important thing is where does this fluid come from so we discussed the physiology but now let us discuss pathology okay so when you study pathological aspects there are multiple sources See, either it can come from the endometrium, okay, or it can come from fallopian tube when there is a hydrosalpinx. So, this is something which we all know, okay, or it can come from hydrosalpinx. That means, or the source can be fallopian tube, or the source can be pelvis, and in the pelvis, the main source is PID, or it can come from the vagina, okay. It can go from vagina up. How does it go from vagina to up? Due to altered microflora, okay. And when we talk of endometrial causes, it is very simple. Either you have chronic endometritis here. So that is also an infection. Either you have endometritis here or you have adhesions. Okay. So these are the only two things. But remember, endometritis causes generalized fluid collection and adhesions usually cause a localized fluid collection. So that is very, very simple. Another thing you must remember, the fluid of adhesions is present throughout the cycle. Now, this is a very, very important clinical point, okay? This is present throughout the menstrual cycle, irrespective of everything. The typical fluid which gets generated in hydrosalpings is going to happen when there is a peak E2 because it causes relaxation of the cornu. The peak estradiol causes cornual relaxation, which causes this fluid which is present here to gush out inside the endometrial cavity. Altered microflora which is present is also going to almost be present throughout the cycle. And your chronic endometritis will generally occur in the follicular phase of the cycle. Okay, this is all generalized. Of course, uh, you can't really individualize and pinpoint it. You have something which is very simple. You have something called as ultrasound. So when you do an ultrasound, you can easily diagnose hydrosalpings. You can easily diagnose pelvic inflammation. You can easily diagnose adhesions, especially when you put in a 3D. Diagnosis of endometritis is best done with hysteroscopy plus biopsy. Okay, that is the standard and diagnosis of altered microflora is best done by something called as high vaginal swab. So, what do we treat and how do we treat and how does this normally get normalized? So, the treatment for hydrosalpinx is very simple. Either you cut it or you just, you know, clip it. You remove the entire hydrosalpinx. So, when you remove the hydrosalpinx, obviously, there is no going to be no fluid which is going to then get coming inside the cavity. That is a very simple treatment. Treatment for pelvic inflammatory disorder and endometritis and altered microflora. All three is going to be the same. It is going to be 21 days of antibiotics. Okay. 21 days of antibiotics, which we normally give is going to be clindac vaginal pessary. Okay. We give clindac vaginal pessary for seven days to the patient. And then we add along with this doxycycline and this doxycycline is given to the patient for 21 days. There are also people who give, instead of doxycycline, they give cyanomycin for 21 days. Okay, both the things will work very well. So that will take care of your pelvic inflammatory disorder. That will take care of your endometritis. And that will also take care of your altered microflora. But it is important to understand that to have a sustained effect, okay, along with all these things, there is something which you must always add. And that is probiotics. Okay, never forget the role of probiotics, especially in endometrial cavity fluid, because endometrial microbiome, okay, I was mentioning about this, the endometrial microbiome plays a great role in implantation. Okay, and the endometrial microbiome is best established by probiotics and this probiotics are best given in oral form, not in vaginal. Vaginal probiotics don't have an effect as good as oral. I will take a master class on probiotics if people wish to, to explain how beautifully oral probiotic can replenish vaginal microbiome much better than what vaginal microbiome can do it on its own. Okay, and finally we come to the last thing and that is the role of 
additions so what do you do in these additions the answer is very simple all of us actually already know the answer and the answer is to do hysteroscopic additionalysis okay once you do hysteroscopic additionalysis your additions are any which way is going to settle down okay the commonest queries which people have as far as endometrial fluid is concerned is that very simple jay i have an endometrium which is like this okay the patient is posted for transfer and you know i have given the date and everything shall i aspirate it this is the commonest thing how to aspirate it so normally the best way to aspirate it is to put an et catheter inside okay put the inner catheter okay and then aspirate if in case you want to but i strongly don't recommend it okay i don't recommend this because it is trust me in more than 90% of the situations it is going to be a physiological thing and just add letrozol in your next cycle for endometrial preparation and you will be able to do it much 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 better okay one really need not go into um one really need not go into things like aspiration of the endometrial fluid and all these things when you want to do i personally don't recommend it at all these days we have a lot of good office hysteroscopy and we were discussing in diagnostic hysteroscopy session dr shilpa had shown an excellent video on how chronic endometritis look she had also posted it on the groups so you can see that revision Uh, of that video which will help you in your practice all right with this i finish this entire session kindly don't go by that thing which is written if there is less than 3 mm of endometrial cavity fluid you can leave and you can do embryo transfer don't believe in that believe me please don't believe in that because we give photo of the endometrium to the patient and in that photo endometrial cavity fluid will be visible and if there is a visible endometrial cavity fluid patients really don't accept negative outcomes with that okay remember one thing in the endometrial cavity fluid is present any which way it is that fluid which causes nourishment to the blastocyst embryo which comes inside it is present only but we are talking of supra physiological fluid any supra physiological fluid is not very good understanding any supra physiological fluid is not so i finish the master class with that and dr shilpa madam can ask me two or three questions yeah so you said supra physiological uh, fluid so how do you say that it is supra physiological see the fluid thin line will be visible so many times uh, yeah. during the stip- yeah so do you so it is it is called to be supra physiological because it is predominantly induced by stimulation right any form of stimulation let's say the natural body's natural endometrium no madam is used to a singular follicular development acting on the endometrial cavity where the peak e2 level doesn't really exceed 200 uh, picograms okay or maybe 250 picograms in a normal and in, in in a normal menstrual cycle all right here when we are doing stimulation our peak e2 any which way is going to be 800 900 400 700 1300 3000 whatever that is not what the endometrium is used to but remember the endometrium has such a good capacity to absorb that fluid that even if the endometrial e2 level is 2000 we hardly see fluid in the endometrial cavity no we don't see it in all patients so only when the functional endometrium secretes more than what it can absorb okay that is when this happens one of the reasons one of the reasons where you will also find this and you will find it commonly just next time just have a look at it and you will find it okay is when you are using low quality hmg that is the first thing and second is when you are having a low amh patient you will also get it in low amh patient the reason why you get endometrial fluid in low amh patient is because ultimately the quality of estrogen which is secreted it depends on the oocyte okay it depends on the oocyte it doesn't depend on you and me it depends on that oocyte and if the quality of that oocyte is poor it will secrete a slightly poor endoestrogen and when it secretes a slightly poor estrogen the receptor modulation which occurs okay is different on the endometrium which is why in low amh also you can have fluid cavity as a result of this you will have fluid cavity even when you give tamoxifen you will have some fluid cavity even when you give ormeloxifen because all of them are not estrogen antagonist they are selective estrogen receptor modulator okay and this modulation is on the quality of estrogen which is secreted is what gives low amh and fluid inside yeah in cases of premature ovarian failure we see yeah. we see this uh, fluid often okay yeah. 
I have seen it. So you think it is because uh, of the... It is because of lack of functional endometrium. The poor premature ovarian failure patient predominantly has only basal endometrium. And basal endometrium will also get the, uh, uh, um, uh, destroyed okay, when there is a prolonged lack of estrogen. Understanding? When you have prolonged lack of estrogen, it causes that causes that fluid to come inside because there is nobody to absorb it. So what do you do in such cases in POFs if you are doing a donor cycle? Donor you should do three cycles or two cycles of endometrial priming. And in that priming, you should give the patient natural body estrogen. So when you give natural body, natural body estrogen, it can be either an estrogen gel or it can be a lighter version. Instead of OCPs, you should give estradiol valerate or you should give estradiol hemihydrate. And then you should give dufastone or registrone to ensure that secretory changes start developing in the new endometrium which develops. Okay, So that endometrial memory comes into play for two to three months and then you go ahead by doing your uh, donor embryo cycle. I mean, sorry, donation egg cycle. Uh, so there is something called uh, early uh, ECF and late ECF. That is one. Yeah, I described that. So when you are looking at early ECF, it is going to be predominantly an endometritis cause. Okay. When you are talking of late ECF, it is going to be predominantly physiological, which is going to occur either due to low AMH or due to hyperstimulation. Do you check for chlamydial antibody titers? No, we don't. We don't. We don't. Uh, so, what is the clinical pregnancy rate and uh, cancellation rates in your uh, experience? 100% of my cycles with endometrial cavity fluid, I will cancel. Because I can't really give that patient that option that, okay, we'll go ahead with the embryo transfer. Okay. And you accept a slightly reduced outcomes. Nobody will accept it in clinical practice, madam. People will accept it in research settings, but not in clinical practice. So this is for IVF setting. So what do we do in IVI cycles? If you see the fluid. I mean, do you, you do must cancel it? it. You must cancel it. And next cycle, as I told, you must add letrozole. See, in your IUI cycles also, you are going to see it when you have either clomiphene citrate induction or you will have induction with uh, HMG alone. Okay. You add letrozole to it, your supraphysiological estrogen goes down. And if it is due to that supraphysiological estrogen, next cycle, there will be nothing. Okay. And what is the role of vaginal sildenafil in such uh, cases? Have you? I have never tried, madam. So I am not aware. Okay. And for endometritis, uh, I know you use uh, placentrix. So yeah. uh, for this uh, ECF cases also, you recommend in case if there is a document oh, no. endometritis? Only in cases of documented endometritis. I mean, only when you have done a histoscopy and you have seen that typical appearance of endometritis, micropolyps, those, you know, striae which are present inside the endometrial cavity, uh, those small hypervascularity along the lateral walls and all these things. Then you can give placentrex injection for 21 days, madam. It will work very nicely. There is no question. It is an off-label indication for giving placentrex. It will work very nicely. And uh, role of L-arginine and vitamin C, vitamin E. No idea. Those, you don't do it, right? I mean, no. as a, okay. And do you treat the husband also in case if there is endometritis? Mandatory. Okay, five-day course of metronidazole to the husband is important. Otherwise, a single tablet of secnidazole to the husband is important. Okay. Two, and, two gram. Uh, two gram. Husband should always take two gram uh, in the night. Two tablets of secnidazole. Okay. And uh, uh, do you do the gene expert uh, for tuberculosis uh, in such cases? For endometrial cavity fluid? Somebody is asking. No, I have not done. I don't do it that way. So tell me, I mean, for uh, the uh, pelvic tuberculosis, I mean, what, mm -hmm. do you, what, what test do you do? The best test for pelvic TB is to put in a diagnostic laparoscope Take a deep peritoneal biopsy. Send this biopsy for culture. That is the best test, very honestly speaking. Second best test is to take that endometrial aspirate. And then you rely on the TBPCR. See, the problem with TBPCR is if you have given, uh, let's say, most of the patients who will come, no madam, they would have taken levofloxacin, doxycycline, something they would have taken. In that, the TBPCR is going to give you falsely low results, falsely negative results. That is the big problem. 
understanding it's not like in abroad countries where papers are published because out of uh, 35000 they have one case of tb so everybody is very excited infectious control disease is very excited to see that tb it is reverse in india in india tb is a uh, sort of a pandemic disease understanding so tb pcr outcomes in india are not going to be as good as tb pcr outcomes which happens in the laboratories abroad okay i we do microbiol culture uh, of tuberculosis in our own laboratory so i know how difficult it is for our microbiologist to grow and culture tb you know it takes 6 to 8 weeks for us to grow and culture it and that also not very accurate because in order to do that you need a deep peritoneal biopsy and that is to be taken with scissors you can't really take that biopsy with shear or or bipolar or harmonic or whatever because it causes that wall no that margin no of that biopsy it causes necrosis there and once it causes necrosis 80% of tb gets disappeared in that necrosis so it has to be a scissor biopsy it will be it will be deep it will bleed a little and that tissue at least 4 to 5 cm of peritoneum should go to your histopathologist for giving a good culture report otherwise he will say culture no tb okay so if you at all if you aspirate the fluid and send it for testing if at all Nothing if you thing will come not for tuberculosis like do you do Achha. do you do culture of that uh, uh, no. say bacterial culture madam that number of fluid which comes from inside no is going to be 0.235 ml don't think 30 ml will come okay if 0.2 or 0.3 ml comes even pus culture will not grow properly on that even for pus culture swab to grow accurately you need that the whole swab to be wet okay so it is not it's not going to help okay for uh, ecf if it is there but there is no ultrasound evidence of hydrosurfaces so do mm. you still go ahead and do a histo lab to check the tube status or do you just do a hysteroscopy to check the endometrial in persistent cases you should do a histo lab in a single cycle you should not okay and what is the best time of the cycle to diagnose communicating hydrosulfings it should be there any time or as follicular phase as i said you know when the peak of e2 occurs that causes the maximum relaxation okay and that is when probably day 8 to day 15 mm-hmm. uh yeah i think i have come to an end so the rest of the questions will take it in the groups okay but it was excellent i think uh, i mean i i browsed everything from last night but there was nothing in the literature that we spoke about today i think i mean you have given wonderful insights uh, on practical aspects as to how to manage i believe like all the fertility specialists who have attended this class or who will watch it will find it really beneficial to their uh, practice so thank you very much have a good day everyone we'll see you again tomorrow thank you very bye much bye bye